Well, I finally got into JoJo's. I feel like everyone has that one series they've just never quite got round to reading or watching. I actually have quite a few, but the big one that stands out to a lot of people when I tell them I've never read it is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I know literally nothing about this series. I've always been told that it's something I'd enjoy and that it's right up my street in terms of my taste, but I've just never got round to actually reading or watching it. So I decided that 2023 was finally going to be the year that I got into JoJo's. Luckily, the first few parts are all entirely available on the Shonen Jump app, so rather than having to go out and spend a lot of money on some admittedly very pretty but relatively expensive hardbacks, I can read through the whole thing there. So I did. Well, at least the parts of it that are out on there. It's worth pointing out now that this video exists in a weird nebulous position in time where my current progress through the JoJo series could be anywhere. I wrote 90% of the script for this video immediately after finishing part 1, Phantom Blood, as I didn't want my experience to be impacted in any way by having read the other parts. This is not a review or a plot summary of JoJo. This is a collation of my thoughts and experiences of the series as I experience it. So as of the time of writing, I've just finished part 1. As of the time of recording, I'm up to part 3. And as of the time of editing, hey future editing Theo, how far are we through this now? Okay, cool, thanks. So it feels kind of weird to be talking about a lot of stuff in this video that I know is going to be wrong with the benefit of hindsight. Does that make sense? Cool. I decided that I was going to experience JoJo's through reading it rather than watching it. There are a few reasons for this. The first and most important reason is that I just straight up prefer reading manga to watching anime. This doesn't just apply to JoJo's. I get through things much quicker, I feel like it's much less of a time sink in my already pretty hectic life, and I find that reading is able to keep my attention span focused more than watching anime. I'm an iPad baby and I find it hard to watch things without getting properly distracted. Another reason is that given that JoJo's was a manga first and didn't actually receive an anime adaptation until a film around 20 years later and a series another 5 years later, I think that reading it is the best way to properly observe the author's original intent with the series, rather than relying on an adaptation, no matter how good or faithful to the source material it actually is. A topic that we're going to discuss in quite a lot of detail later is the relationship between JoJo's and the time period it was written and published in. And leaving 25 years between the source material and an adaptation is definitely going to widen the gap between Araki's initial intent with the series and the way it's portrayed in an adaptation. So if you want to tell me that I'm wrong and that I should be watching JoJo's instead of reading it, then yeah, go ahead and do that. It took over a decade of nagging from friends for me to read it in the first place, so let's start the warm-up for that now and then maybe I can get into the anime and make a whole new series of videos about that in 2034. So why haven't I gotten into JoJo's before now? To put it simply, it just hasn't appealed to me until now. I'm pretty picky with the shonen series that I read in the first place, and while I didn't think that JoJo's looked awful, it didn't really do anything to pique my interest in any way. I was also completely oblivious to this series' existence until the anime adaptation started in 2012, and suddenly every single person that I followed on Tumblr was the world's biggest JoJo's fan and always had been. I looked it up, saw that it was already 25 years into serialization, and paid no more attention to it at all. It's also a bit of an understatement to say that JoJo's fans are very, um, passionate about their favourite series, and observing them from afar hasn't exactly swayed me over to their cause, as fun as it is to wind them up a little bit. I once made a very obviously joke comment about JoJo's being a cheap Dragon Ball ripoff, and a friend blocked me on Twitter and didn't speak to me for over a year, so that kinda just spurred me on to keep winding people up over the next few years. I'm a terrible person, I'm sorry, it's just too much fun. Shout out to my good friend Harry who actually predicted I was reading this series months ago. Um, I'm sorry I've been lying to you for the past year or so. And also shout out to my other good friend Jace who once again told me I should read it at a New Year's party this year. To which I responded something along the lines of, I don't need to read it. I've already read it. But I don't think you believed me judging from your reaction. Why would I lie to my friends Jace? I told you I've read it. Okay, that's enough with the winding up JoJo's fans for one lifetime, I guess I technically am one now. Or at least I'm someone who's read JoJo's. Whether or not I'm a fan is still very much up for debate, but we'll get into that. I think it might actually be useful to run through what I already knew about JoJo's before reading the series. It's very little. Just to give a bit more context about what I learned through my time reading it. It's about some guys called JoJo. Or at least JoJo is a portmanteau of their first names and surnames. I know that there isn't just one guy called Jojo. 
I've seen pictures of different Jojos and I'm aware they all have different names like Jonathan and Joseph, but I could honestly not tell you which one is which or what relation they are to one another. I think they are all descendants or ancestors to each other, but I don't know who is what or which series they appear in. There's just a bunch of guys called Jojo. What's better than this? Guys being called Jojo. There are these things called stands. I think these are like magical spirits that have cool powers. They are also named after songs. I don't know if you can collect these like magical ghost spirit Pokemon. I don't know if everyone has one or if only some people have them. And I don't know what they actually do. I just know that there are things called stands that have cool powers. Everyone stands like this. Or like this. Or like this. I don't know why, but people in JoJo's are always doing this. There's a guy called Dio, and he says it was I, Dio, all the time. I think he's the villain. I genuinely don't know. Everyone is really ugly. I think this might be one of the big reasons I didn't get into the series by now, and that is that I have never seen a JoJo's character whose design I actually liked. That opinion might change later on in the series, but I do not like looking at any of the JoJo's characters. They are all so ugly. Not every part is good. Like any long-running series, I'm aware that the quality of JoJo's is very heavily going to fluctuate over the course of its run. I've heard pretty big JoJo's fans say that some parts of it are abysmal, and yet some parts of it are some of the best fiction they've ever read. I do not know which parts are meant to be the good ones and which ones are meant to be the bad ones. The characters are named after songs. I think they're all named as like funny references to classic rock songs like Dio, and I think I've seen tweets about one guy called fucking Foo Fighters. Also, I heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from another that there's a guy called Ario Speedwagon. And I love Ario Speedwagon, so I really hope that I like this character. And I think that's everything. Look, I'm checking all my prejudices against this series at the door, and I'm going in with an open mind as I begin the treacherous journey into one of the most celebrated manga of all time. Let's do it. Let's finally get into JoJo's. Oh, what the hell? This thing's only got 44 chapters? Hello? Hi! Oh, hi Ben! Hiya! What's good? So, how did you find it? Um, it was alright. Phantom Blood is alright. I have no idea what the general consensus is on Phantom Blood, as when I hear some people say some parts are great and some parts are diabolical, I just don't hear people mention Phantom Blood at all. Absolutely none of the costumes, fan art, or clips of Jojo that I've seen have been from this part. And beyond recognizing the names of some of the characters, which I'm pretty sure are recurring characters to some degree anyway, this was all completely new to me. I neither loved nor hated Phantom Blood. Sorry if that's a disappointment and you're hoping for a spicy video where I rip the shit out of this, or admit my folly over the years and pledge allegiance to the JoJo's cause as its newest devotee, though it did intrigue me into progressing further through the series. My main worry was that I'd finally commit to reading JoJo's, and then I'd find the first part so diabolically bad that I'd regret every decision that led me to this point, and have to slog through the rest of the series with a pretty bitter taste in my mouth. Fortunately, that wasn't the case, as there was a lot in Phantom Blood that I really, really liked. There was also quite a lot that I really disliked as well, so we'll cover both as we go through this video. What do you want first? What I liked or what I disliked? I don't know why I'm asking, this isn't a choose your own adventure video. The choice has already been made for you, the video's already finished, your free will is an illusion. I liked that it doesn't explain things. No, like seriously, I like that it doesn't explain a lot of things to you. This might sound like kind of a sarcastic comment, but I promise you it isn't. Phantom Blood's willingness to throw some pretty simple concepts at you without getting bogged down in needless world building and exposition is honestly one of its biggest strengths. So many series that I've read have been let down by just adding walls and walls of dialogue and exposition about power scaling and combat techniques. But Phantom Blood works so well by just having a couple of relatively simplistic key concepts which are presented with the barest of minimums of explanations as to how they work and just kind of runs with it. So there's this evil stone mask from an ancient civilization that we found. It turns people into invincible murder vampire zombies. Okay, great. I genuinely don't need to know more than that. I don't need 17 chapters explaining the intricate mechanics of how it affects a human psyche. I'm looking directly at you, Jujutsu Kaisen. I just need to know what it is and not how it does it. The evil stone mask is used exactly as a MacGuffin should be. It's a catalyst for the plot's events. 
And honestly, knowing less about it just kind of adds more to the whole mystery aspect of the series as well. When Dio uses the mask and becomes basically unstoppable for a large portion of the series, no one knows how to stop him. We pretty much have to learn it as the characters do. This lack of in-depth explanation may just be a product of the series' length constraints. 44 chapters is pretty short for a shonen series, and there isn't time to get too bogged down in dialogic exposition, but this honestly works in the series' favour pretty well. The same idea also goes for Hamon, or Ripple as it seems to be called in some places. I'm gonna call it Hamon because that's what the translation that I read calls it. Hamon is this cool energy wave that's produced that kind of acts like solar energy, but not really. Also, water conducts it super well, so it can be used for all sorts of crazy creative effects. Sort of like a slightly more zany but restricted water bending. Hamon is used for basically whatever the story needs it to be used for, and that's a good thing. By not going super overboard in the details of how Hamon works or where it comes from, when a new use of the technique is introduced, such as healing, it doesn't feel out of place or like someone has plot armor when they use a new technique. We have a pretty blank slate when it comes to our understanding of what Hamon is and what it can do. So by keeping an open mind as to what it can do, these new techniques make sense. If all we really know about Hamon is that it's an innate form of energy identical to the sun's rays, when viewed through the lens of a wacky fantasy battle manga, being told that it has magical healing properties as well as combat properties fits right in with what we already know. I was surprised to see that there weren't any stands in this part, as I kinda thought they were a staple of the entire series, but I guess they must debut in a future part. I have no idea which one though. I didn't feel like I was missing out though, as Hammond was a super creative power mechanic that I really enjoyed seeing being used and manipulated in different ways. I liked that it was short. No, again, this is not a sarcastic comment. I really liked that Phantom Blood seemed succinct enough to tell its own story without being dragged on and on and overstaying its welcome. But also, it didn't feel rushed either. It's really easy to score brownie points in a review and pretend like you know what you're talking about by praising the pacing of a piece of media. But Phantom Blood really does feel well paced. I immediately got the sense after finishing it that Araki had a very clear story he wanted to tell with this part and was able to do it in 44 chapters, no more and no less. Longer or shorter series aren't inherently bad. Two of my top five manga of all time fall on either end of this spectrum. Uh, they are One Piece and Solanin, in case you're wondering. And varying lengths do work when the series in question calls for them. One Piece is a sprawling fantasy epic revolving around liberating the world from tyranny and sailing the entire ocean looking for treasure. 1000 plus chapters is a strength in this kind of story, not a flaw. Solanin is a beautiful tale of loss, trauma, and the process of grieving in the modern world, the breakneck speed of which waits for no one. Two volumes is the perfect length. Phantom Blood manages to tell every story beat perfectly before switching to the next at what seems to be the pace Araki intended, which is really refreshing to see. I don't know how much editorial influence and meddling impacted the pacing and events of Phantom Blood, or if Araki was just allowed to tell the story he always envisioned, but hey, it worked. I liked that it's weird. I found it really hard to categorize Phantom Blood in terms of a genre, and we'll get to that a bit later on in more detail, in that I wasn't really sure if it was an intentional comedy, a super serious battle manga, or somewhere in between. Again, we'll get to that. But the parts of the series I really appreciated was its willingness to get weird. This sort of ties in with the first point I made about not fully explaining things, but I found that the lack of exposition allows things to get super funky and kind of freaky at points. There's a decent amount of body horror in here, which I really didn't expect. Huge stone tentacles drilling into people's brains, zombie mutants, and people being blown apart. I didn't expect this to be such a large point, but I really liked that it was. The new weird is a genre that really interests me, and some of the more bizarre, haha, elements of it do seem to flirt with that genre quite a bit. And they do it quite well. I mean, sure, why not just throw in Jack the Ripper during a quick arc which involves a trip to London? Just put in some weird and wacky concepts, and if you don't address them or take them super seriously, it can work. Not everything needs to be fully explained, and I'm really glad that Phantom Blood seems to have a good grasp on this concept. I like the fights. This is one part I really didn't expect to be a fan of. I'm not a huge shonen fan in general, especially the more battle-oriented series. I often find prolonged fights in manga to be kind of dull. One Piece is an exception. The fights in that are really creative and fun. I will not be accepting any feedback at this time. Thank you. But each fight in Phantom Blood had a real sense of urgency to it. I know that there's a different Jojo in each series, and I think there might be a few Dio's as well. 
So I really had no idea what was going to happen to either of the main characters each time they clashed through the series. I know that death isn't the only stake that can be raised during a fight, but honestly not knowing if characters were going to make it out alive or not was a pretty exhilarating feeling, especially near the end of the series in the final few chapters. The use of Hamon, like I mentioned earlier, really added to this too, as the way in which Jojo and some of the other characters like Zeppeli use Hamon get really interesting and creative, meaning fights are never dull no matter how long or short they are, as characters find new and increasingly creative ways to manipulate the pretty open-ended power system they have at their disposal. I like fights in One Piece because I love seeing how Oda uses relatively straightforward devil fruit or hacky powers to do creative things, and I like seeing fights in Phantom Blood because I love seeing how Araki uses relatively straightforward Hamon powers to do creative things. Are you feeling me now? Despite there being a lot that I really liked about the series, there was also obviously a lot that I really kind of disliked. It's going to be really interesting seeing if these issues are consistent throughout the series or if they're ironed out in future parts, but hey, I'm a hater at heart, so let's get into some of the major issues I had with Phantom Blood, which are currently preventing me from outright saying I am now a fan of JoJo's. I really don't like Jojo. For all the praise I've heaped onto the series' ability to convey great storytelling through a variety of methods, its biggest and most consistent flaw is its character writing. I do not like Jonathan Joestar, and he's not even the worst fucking character in this series. Jonathan Joestar is a paragon of justice, honor, and gentlemanly-like behavior. And not much else. I'm going to preempt this part by saying that I'm not expecting Jonathan to go through a full developmental character arc within the space of 44 chapters. The lack of changes or development in his character isn't a problem. I'm fine with one note characters provided that the singular note that they can provide is good. Jonathan's is not good. Jonathan is a very good example of what I like to call the Kenzo Tenma problem. Yes, I will find a way to talk about Naoki Urasawa in pretty much every piece of media analysis I do. Fucking deal with it. Monster is an incredibly celebrated series by Naoki Urasawa. Amongst Urasawa's series, it's pretty much unanimously considered to be his best, constantly appearing near the top of a lot of pretty respectable publications, greatest manga and anime of all time lists. For me, however, I would rank it as one of his weaker series, despite it still being really, really good. The main issue I have with Monster is Dr. Kenzo Tenma, the series protagonist. Dr. Kenzo Tenma is a good, honorable man. Really good really honorable, the best neurosurgeon we've ever seen, and the series does not let you forget that. Within the first couple of chapters, Kenzo has saved the life of a child thought to be as good as dead, despite his superior's orders to instead operate on a much older, much more important politician who arrived at his hospital after the child. This causes Kenzo to fall out of favor with the hospital, suffer a series of demotions due to his subordinates, being left by his horrid fiance who was only using him for his money and status in the first place. Poor Dr. Tenma has had everything taken from him because he was too good at being doctor, too smart, too honorable. Of course, the boy whose life he saved later grows up to be a brainwashed, psychopathic, mass-murdering Hitler youth protege, and Kenzo then has to struggle with the moral dilemma that because he saved this child's life, he is responsible for the monster he created. Poor Kenzo. Once again, your brilliance at being doctor has been your downfall. You truly are a paragon of virtue, honor, and doctor. Oh, how we love you. Jonathan is in pretty much the same boat as Tenma, only without inadvertently creating a literal Nazi. I could honestly tell you very little about Jonathan beyond how good he is, beyond how kind and nice he is to people. We see a lot of Jonathan's monologues where he constantly tells the reader how he hates how mean and dishonorable Dio is, and how this isn't how a proper man should conduct business. This gets him into a lot of trouble, causing people around him to get hurt by the evil Dio who's come to ruin his life for not really any reason. But Jonathan knows that telling people about this is not the gentlemanly way, and that a real proper British gent wouldn't resolve matters this way. He can't sink to Dio's level and play these same dirty games. Uh, I find this constant barrage of reminders about how morally good Jonathan is to be exhausting, to be honest. It doesn't ever feel like he's being properly challenged by anyone or anything within the series, beyond just people being mean and ruining his life. He never once has to grapple with compromising his upstanding morals, leading to him questioning if being a truly honorable and truly good man is always necessary in every situation. It's the same threats over and over, with Jonathan still being the same morally uptight, proud gentleman he always has been, which never really connected with me in the first place. Serialized media, especially shown in manga, often live or die by their protagonist, 
And with Jonathan being a relatively weak and uninteresting character, it's hard to root either for Jonathan as a hero overcoming adversity and saving the day, or against him, and indulge in a good bit of theatrical villainy throughout the series as we watch him suffer. This latter point could be possible with a really good villain who's able to challenge Jonathan and allow us to revel in the schadenfreude of this goody two-shoes getting his face repeatedly caved in, but unfortunately, I really dislike Dio. Uh, this was a really disappointing part of the series for me. I'd heard and seen so much about Dio, about this wonderfully camp theatrical villain who's the epitome of evil and a really truly horrible bad bastard who will stop at nothing to achieve world domination. But I just found Dio kind of bland. And it's for the same reasons that I have an issue with Jonathan, only now it's on the other end of the spectrum. Whereas the series constantly reminds us how Jonathan is truly virtuous, a divine specimen of an epic gentle sir, it also constantly reminds us how Dio is the worst person to ever exist. And I mean, constantly. Within only a handful of chapters of his initial appearance, Dio has rocked up out of nowhere, punched Jonathan for seemingly no apparent reason, burned his dog alive, killed Jonathan's also annoyingly honorable and virtuous father, and hatched a scheme to steal the Joestar fortune. Look, we love a good horrible bastard, but every single appearance of Dio, every panel he's in, every line of dialogue, serves very little purpose beyond just upping the ante of just how evil he is. And it gets really tiring really quickly. I fucking get it. Loading up a new page and seeing a bunch of panels of Dio monologuing immediately becomes really predictable. Like, I know he's going to tell Jonathan how pathetic he is, and how he's going to steal his fortune, and how he's going to kill him, and how he's so powerful, and how he's going to take over the world, and yeah, I, I just can't bring myself to root for Dio either. Every interaction between the two main characters is just really predictable, even in a series as short as Phantom Blood. Dio essentially amounts to nothing more than a less interesting, less funny Count Olaf, and I just really didn't care for any of the interactions he has with Jonathan, which is a pretty significant portion of the series given that they are the two main characters. The events, plot developments, and story beats of Phantom Blood are all well and good, but can only make me like the series so much when the dialogue, characters, and characterization within are all pretty poor. I really would have liked this series with more pro and antagonists who are allowed to exist without constant beating over the head kind of reminders of their primary character traits. It's not that I care that they're one-dimensional, I'm fine with truly upstanding and good heroes and downright horrid irredeemable bastard villains, but please let them do something beyond just talk about how good and evil they are. It gets tiring very quickly. I'm going to hold out hope that future parts have better iterations of both Jojo and Dio. I know that these guys are recurring characters in some sense, like I don't know if they're reincarnations or relatives or whatever, but I hope that Araki figures out what to do with his heroes and villains in future installments. It would be a real shame if this were a recurring theme that consistently lets each part down. Unfortunately, it's not even like I can rely on the supporting cast of characters to add a bit of spice to the situation, because despite my pretty heavy critique of them, Jonathan and Dio are still probably the two best characters in the series. I really, really fucking hate Speedwagon. Speedwagon exists to narrate fights. That's it. That is his purpose in the story. Believe it or not, I am able to see what is happening in fights. They are right there, on the page, in front of me. I do not need Speedwagon telling me what is happening in the fights. The series already has an omniscient narrator, so I do not need Speedwagon to also narrate what is happening in the story. There is absolutely nothing of value added to the series by this fucking guy, and I really fucking hate him. I was very sad he survived to the end of the story. I wished a stray blow would catch him mid-sentence every time he opened his stupid fucking mouth during an otherwise solidly choreographed fight scene. I get that over-the-top commentary and narration was something of a trope back in the 80s at the time of publication, and I know that JoJo's isn't the only series to use this trope detrimentally, but I've never had it stick out like such a sore thumb to me, to the point where it became impossible to ignore amongst what were otherwise pretty engaging and creative fight scenes. Fuck you, Speedwagon. I hope you die and never come back. Go narrate some other series. I'm probably never going to get around to reading Haikyuu at this point, so go narrate some fucking volleyball or something. I mentioned near the start of the video that I never really liked how characters in JoJo's look. 
and I think they're all pretty hideous. And my opinion on that hasn't changed, but it hasn't led to me disliking the series in any way like I thought it probably would. I don't like Araki's drawing style. I don't like the way he designs characters, and I don't like the weird poses he constantly puts them in, or the frankly hideous outfits he makes them wear. But it's very clear that he has a consistent style which he sticks to throughout the series. I might not like the end result of it, but I can appreciate that this is Araki successfully visually portraying exactly what he wants to portray, even if that isn't to my taste. Which is kind of the key to creating any piece of media, successfully portraying your ideas. I'm not a visual artist at all, so I don't know how to properly critique anatomy or how people should be drawn. But I can very easily overlook or not allow something that's not to my taste to impact my enjoyment of a series when it's so evident that the creator's artistic vision is so thoroughly accomplished through the work he's created. So keep on drawing your horrid, ugly little men, Araki. I might not like them, but you're consistently and successfully portraying your artistic vision for your funky little series, which is far more important from a creator's standpoint than every single person having them to their taste, which is fine by me. I just won't be joining any cosplay groups anytime soon. Sorry, Jace. The intonation in which I intended that sentence to be read probably didn't come out too well through text. This isn't a, how the fuck do you expect me to enjoy this shit kind of question, but more of a, through what lens do you want me to experience and evaluate this series kind of question. Before reading Phantom Blood, I'd made passing reference to friends about JoJo's being a comedy-centric series, because that's honestly what I thought it was, in the same vein that despite being a battle-heavy shonen manga, Dragon Ball is a comedy series first and foremost. But I got met with a lot of comments back that, no, 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 jo JoJo's isn't a comedy, it's quite serious in nature, despite its bizarre elements. I've also seen quite a lot of debate about whether or not JoJo's should exist as a shonen series, given that it deals with a lot more darker subject matter with more graphic visual imagery than typical shonen we might experience nowadays. And I think that's why I had such an issue with deciding how I should be viewing this series as I read it. And that's due to the time that I started reading JoJo's. JoJo's was first published a full seven years before I was even born. Reading it in 2023 is bound to come with a whole bunch of different interpretations and experiences compared to reading it when it was first published. I enjoyed Phantom Blood the most when I viewed it as a crazy, over-the-top, super campy, pantomime-esque battle romp, but I don't know if that's how it's meant to be viewed. Like, I don't know if that's how Araki wants this series to be perceived. It's very easy to see it that way now when we have that kind of media in relative abundance, but was that really the intention back in 1987? This is a genuine question. If this is how the series was meant to be viewed, then let me know. Let's talk about it, drop comments or join the Discord, drive up the engagement on these videos so I can quit my day job. When I was reading Phantom Blood, I really got the feeling that even though I was experiencing and enjoying it this way, it's not the way I'm meant to be doing it. It constantly feels like Araki is wanting me to take this series quite a bit more seriously than I actually am. I might be laughing at the ridiculous over-the-top characterization and crazy-ass outfits that everyone wears, but I think they're meant to be played kind of straight. I'm constantly flip-flopping between different critical lenses, with some leading me to enjoying the series significantly more than others. If a lot of the elements I'm enjoying are meant to be played significantly more seriously than I'm interpreting them, and I try to re-experience JoJo's that way, I'll probably end up enjoying it quite a bit less. I'm laughing while reading the series, but I can't tell if I'm laughing with it or laughing at it. And to be completely honest, I don't think it matters. If it leads me to enjoy the series a bit more, then I'm going to keep viewing it as a crazy, wacky, funny, silly, over-the-top adventure, even if that's not what its original intent was back in the 1980s. I don't plan on scoring each JoJo's part, as in giving them a numbered score, Anthony Fantano style. I don't think that will end well for anyone involved, and I honestly don't know what I would score Phantom Blood anyway but I do plan on rating each part somehow. I've spent quite a bit of time workshopping a really complex and expensive piece of machinery to do this with, so without further ado, let's reveal the Jojometer. The Jojometer is a highly complex mechanical device which allows me to put the Jojo series in order of how much I enjoyed them. There are nine segments on here, as there are currently nine Jojo's parts, and I do plan on releasing a video for all of them. Oh god, this is gonna take fucking years. Being at the bottom of the Jojometer does not necessarily mean I would score the series that ends up there a 0, nor does being at the top mean I would score it a 10, and that it's perfect. If I'm being honest, I would be very surprised if either of those series are reached. 
The only 0 out of 10 series I've ever read are Aho Girl and the manga adaptation of Danganronpa the Animation. And Pluto, Dr. Slump, Full Metal Alchemist, Solanin, and One Piece are the only 10 out of 10s I've ever read. And it would have to take something really fucking special to reach either of those scores. This device exists entirely to put the series in order from least to most enjoyed, so the positions of each part are probably going to change as I release more videos in the series. As it stands, I have absolutely nothing with which to compare Phantom Blood, so it goes right here, slap bang in the middle of the Jojometer. Warning, warning, this does not mean that Phantom Blood is mid, this does not mean that Phantom Blood is a 5 out of 10, are we fucking clear on that one? Please do not send the Pinkertons to my house to light me on fire. Okay, time to get cracking on part 2. I've also never heard a single person talk about battle tendency. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe. If you find my JoJo's analysis to be completely incorrect and you are very passionate about this series and want to tell me how stupid I am, then please also do that. I really need engagement on these videos. I would like to quit my job and make these full time. Um, subscribe to the channel, join the Discord or follow me on Twitter. The links are down below and I'll probably see you in the next one. I don't plan on releasing the JoJo's videos in succession. That's a surefire way for me to get burnt out on this little mini series that I'm making. There will probably be other videos between this and my Battle Tendency one, but the Battle Tendency one is coming. I know I lied and said in the last video that my next one is going to be a Dragon Ball one, but I do actually have a Dragon Ball video written, so fucking subscribe if you want to see it. Bye.